We're going on assignment with the Voice of America. Violence in the Central African Republic, that is story one this week on Assignment. I'm Alex Villarreal. And I'm Imran Siddiqui. In India, wiping out the last traces of polio, we'll hear from our science reporter. Marijuana laws are under transition in the United States. Is it sweeping change or just a big experiment? And in our On Assignment Rewind segment, a witness to the death penalty, what's his take on capital punishment? Come along with us as we bring you the stories behind the stories from VOA reporters around the world. This is On Assignment. We begin in the Central African Republic, still mired in strife nearly a year after a coup that saw mainly Muslim rebels topple President Francois Bozizé. Thousands have died in the violence between majority Christians and minority Muslims, and the clashes just keep getting worse, despite the presence of thousands of peacekeeping troops. VOA correspondent Gabe Joslow has traveled to the CAR, and we talked about the former French colony's growing interreligious conflict. Now, CAR is about 15 percent Muslim. The rest of the population is pretty much Christian. So what we're seeing now is a rift between Muslim and Christian communities. Uh, and uh, basically these militia groups have aligned uh, based on these religious lines. And so that's sort of like a very troubling aspect of this conflict. And it's a problem that did not exist in the Central African Republic before uh, the coup last year. Now, Gabe, French and African peacekeepers went in to try to calm these tensions, but how much are they actually helping? Because it seems like the violence has just been getting worse. Yeah, I think there are cases where you're seeing uh, French troops have done an okay job of disarming some of the, the gangs that are, uh, that are causing trouble, uh, mostly in the capital. A lot of the time they're outnumbered or they're not in the position uh, geographically to help out. A lot of the conflicts flare up in places that are far outside the capital. For instance, the last time I was in uh, Central African Republic, there was violence uh, in a town called Bukha, which is about 200 kilometers north of the capital. Uh, along just really atrocious roads that are basically impassable, especially during the rainy season. Uh, and there was really no force in that area except for the Seleka rebels and then these community militias who had risen up uh, to attack them. So we saw a lot of violence and nobody was really there to step in to, to stop it. Uh, another problem we're seeing with the peacekeepers, particularly the French, uh, are accusations that they've taken the side of the Christian militias. So a lot of the Muslim community uh, feel like they haven't been doing enough to protect them, so there's a little bit of mistrust of that force. Uh, in terms of the African peacekeeping force, MISCA, which is really still becoming established, uh, they have about 5,000 troops on the ground and they're trying to get up to 6,000. So we'll see once they have a full force uh, if they'll be able to conduct more regular patrols, if they'll be able to intervene uh, when you see these street clashes uh, rising up. Uh, so that, that force, you know, just the sheer number of people that will be on the ground could have a, a better impact. Now, Gabe, you talk about this time that you spent in the CAR covering the violence there. What was it like being a, a journalist uh, there? Yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult place to work, mostly for logistical reasons. I mean, it's, uh, there, there aren't, at the time, there weren't really a whole lot of international journalists uh, in the area. Uh, so it was very much new territory. Government officials didn't really know how to deal with you, and it was hard to figure out what sort of uh, permissions you needed to go here or to go there. And also, at the time, the rebels were really in control uh, in most areas. So it was always a, a, a question when you entered a new territory of who was really in charge. Uh, so that was a bit of a problem. Well, up in Bukai, it was all Selica in charge, uh, and they were a little surprised to see us show up there uh, in this very remote town, but uh, uh, we're also very keen to show us uh, some of the atrocities that had been committed against the Muslim community. Uh, so what I found was sort of interesting is that uh, they, they, they were receptive to the media, aware uh, that uh, the kind of attention a, a journalist could bring to their plight could have a, a broader impact around the world. And you talked about a specific instance uh, you mentioned to me about how there's sort of this reverse filming going on, that while you were filming the, the violence that was going on, you yourself, you were also being filmed. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was one of these interesting moments that we had when I was in Bukha. I was working with uh, Selica rebels uh, and filming them and trying to understand what they were all about and what had gone on in that town. Uh, and while I was filming them and they were, uh, I was doing interviews with their commanders, uh, one of their commanders had actually turned a little camera on me. 
So it was this very strange uh, moment where I felt like I was really being watched by them. Later, they would show me some films they had um, of the attacks that had taken place. You know, they, they were recording, uh, at least in that area, as much as they could. And the other thing that we're seeing, though, that is a, a bit troubling is that a lot of the violence that, were, that has taken place in the last couple of months, including these really vicious lynchings in the Capitol, uh, a lot of them are taking place in front of news cameras. Uh, and this is another way that reporters are put in a very awkward position because you start to get the feeling that uh, while there is violence taking place off camera, a lot of it is being played up and really being, you know, uh, exaggerated or people are trying to put on a show as gruesome as it is for the media that's there. So you're stuck with this question of uh, responsibility because, of course, you need to cover what's going on here. You know, it's, a, it's an important crisis and one that was overlooked for many, many years. But you don't want to feel like you're perpetuating this violence by your presence. Uh, so that's something that uh, to look out for. Even uh, you know, a, a recent Human Rights Watch report mentioned that a lot of this violence is taking place in front of cameras, and almost any, uh, any all of these lynchings and, and and really horrible acts that are taking place in the Capitol, there's almost always a news camera around. VOA Nairobi correspondent Gabe Joslow. To escape the violence in the CER, about a million people, some 20% of the nation's population, have fled their homes. Doctors Without Borders says efforts to protect civilians have been an utter failure. Now to an international medical success story. It's been three years since India last recorded a new case of polio. That puts the entire region on target to be certified polio-free. But as VOA's Steve Barragona told On Assignment's Doug Bernard, that success may still be in jeopardy. It took decades of vaccination campaigns costing about $2 billion before Indian Health Minister Ghulam Nabi Azad could make this announcement. Today is the historic day when we have completed three years without a single case of wild polio. Many thought the crippling disease would never be driven from India. The campaign battled dense population, high birth rates, frequent migration, poor sanitation, and weak health systems. This was incredible. I mean, the fact that India, uh, th there were a lot of folks who said this could never be done um, because India is a huge country. Uh, they have weak health systems. Uh, they have problems with sanitation because mm -hmm. uh, the, the virus spreads through open sewage. That's a, a very common way for the virus to spread. So what they had to do was send around multiple times a year um, tens of thousands of people to go literally door to door to find every child they could. I mean, the, the goal was to vaccinate every child in India under the age of five. We're talking back when I was traveling to India to cover this stuff, we were talking about 185 million children. Needed to all be, across the country. All across the country uh, needed to be covered several times a year because the vaccine needs several doses to be active. Workers have been delivering vaccine to the hardest to reach communities over and over again for years. Officials say that same commitment will be needed in Pakistan, Afghanistan and Nigeria, the last three countries that have never stopped polio transmission. Is it that, is it really just that sort of expenditure uh, that India laid out that made it successful in nations, neighboring nations like Pakistan and Afghanistan, they have not yet been able to eradicate polio. Is, is that really the difference, just expenditure of money? One is political will. Um, India wanted it and pursued it and kept at it because they fell back. I mean, they were on the verge of uh, being polio free several times. Mm -hmm. And then um, from what officials you know, told me was that people would get complacent and they'd slack off and then there would be another outbreak. Um, so, but they kept at it and they kept at it and they kept at it and they kept at it. Um, so, and some other countries, you don't see that kind of political will. Um, and also the, the countries that, are, that still have polio uh, they have a lot of problems with internal conflict. Uh, Nigeria, mm -hmm. we've got a uh, real conflict situation. Uh, obviously, Pakistan, Afghanistan is in the news practically every day. Um, and that's, in these countries, when the health system falls apart, whatever health system there is, and you can't vaccinate kids, uh, then it makes them susceptible to infection again. And you've got the virus is already out there in right. places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Nigeria, just waiting for somebody to be available to infect. You use the phrase polio anywhere is a threat uh, everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and I used it earlier the, the, the word eradication. Polio has not been eradicated. It still exists. But ultimately, do you think it's possible to 
really eradicate, to completely eliminate this disease? Yes. And that's why they've been working so hard at it. This is one of the very few diseases that really can be eradicated. Um, if you can get, if you can interrupt transmission, um, if you can stop the virus from finding new hosts, and you do that by vaccinating and vaccinating and vaccinating and vaccinating, um, then if the virus has no, no more children to jump to, it stops. Uh, so it's one of these things where you measure the, the incidence of polio in very small numbers uh, for, you know, for a planet of, uh, of 7 billion people. Very few cases left. If we can get those last cases, this disease is done. Um, and there's only been one disease that has ever been eradicated before, and that's smallpox. Nobody gets smallpox anymore. It used right. to kill people. Nobody gets it now. Um, they're very close, uh, very, very close. But these last few places are going to be the hardest. And our thanks, of course, to VOA's Steve Barragona. Recently, Bill Gates called India's three-year polio-free record the greatest health achievement he's ever seen. And he says he hopes nations such as Nigeria and Pakistan will follow India's example. We're taking a break now, but coming up, legalizing marijuana. It's happened in a few U.S. states, but is it the right thing to do? You're watching on Assignment. Last year, Uruguay became the first country to legalize the production and sale of marijuana for recreational purposes. And on January 1st, Colorado became the first U.S. state to do so. A similar measure in Washington state will take effect soon, and other states could follow suit. VOA's Brian Patton joins me right now. He just got back from Colorado. Thank you so much for joining me. How, how is the legalization of marijuana affecting the state of Colorado? Well, it's a big economic boom initially for it. Uh, it began legal operations as of January 1st, and businesses I visited in Denver said there were lines out the door and around the corner for that first week. Um, one of the biggest dispensaries I went to visit is the name is Medicine Man Denver. It's a huge establishment. And what they tell me is they were previously only dealing in medical marijuana, where you needed a prescription to get it. Now, with recreational marijuana, they say, their best day during the medical marijuana time is equivalent to a normal day now. Wow. But there's still, I mean, critics are still arguing for and against the legalization uh, when it's not used for medical purposes. What, 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 are the, what, what kind of arguments did you come across in Colorado? One of the major concerns about how Colorado is legalizing this for recreational purposes is the message it's sending to young people. You're not seeing a lot of public education about the dangers of it. You're seeing a lot of happy people smoking. You're talking about how it's free and legal. And critics of the legalization bill say it sends the wrong message. It glamorizes it. Critics would also argue that alcohol is glamorized. You know, you've got pop stars coming in and showing off. But with that said, what about the dangers in terms of driving buzzed or driving uh, under the influence of alcohol? How do, you, how do they compare between these two? Well, the state legislator has passed a certain percentage of THC in the blood level to indicate uh, what intoxication would be. But police in Denver have been dealing with medical marijuana for years have been dealing with people intoxicated for years. And the police tell me they have no problem dealing with anyone who's intoxicated, whether it's on marijuana, on prescription drugs, on alcohol. If you are driving a vehicle unsafely and you seem intoxicated, they, they, they have the uh, authority to act. And, and do you think uh, the economy will benefit from this? They're saying that we can uh, they're projecting I think $500 million per year in sales from this. Of that, 67 to 70 million is revenue for the state. A lot of that money will go to enforcing regulations to try to keep marijuana out of children, away from children, to keep it from traveling out of the state, and to keep 
uh, to u be used for education and treatment programs. Okay, and we have some uh, goodies here. Uh, I shouldn't be calling them goodies, actually. No. Excuse me for that, no. but we have some Very products here that powerful. Brian got from Colorado. What's that? These are uh, one of the fastest growing parts of the legal marijuana industry are infused products, cakes. These are candies. Uh, they're infused with THC and they come, these were developed for the medical marijuana patients. And so there's very uh, precise indications on how much THC is in each little piece of candy. I'm told that these are especially dangerous in the sense that they look like candy to children. And so parents are, are, are warned to please be very careful with these and put these away. All right, great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us. Looking You're forward welcome. to it. All right. All right. Now, viewers, Brian Patton. Uh, moving on, we're taking a break now, but on the other side, we look into another law that some people want changed. You're watching On Assignment. The death penalty is carried out in many U.S. states, often by lethal injection, but a shortage now of chemicals used for the drugs has left some U.S. states considering other older means of execution, including what we used to see, the electric chair. No U.S. state puts more people to death than Texas. More than 500 people have been executed there since 1982, and the Huntsville State Prison in Texas has the busiest execution chamber in the country. Well, VOA's Jerome Sokolovsky went to Huntsville and he met the former death house chaplain, a man who has a unique perspective on capital punishment, as Jerome told me when we talked about it in a segment we first featured last year. Okay, I want this. Is there are ghosts in Reverend Carol Pickett's closet, 95 to be exact. But this is part of the tapes. That's the number of inmates put to death while he was chaplain at the Texas State Execution Chamber in Huntsville. I made the tapes in the, the next day or the next night to get it all out. Well, he admitted he was nervous, and it showed in quite some ways, many ways, that he was scared. You talk about uh, how Reverend Pickett was present during these executions. What exactly was his role as prison chaplain? He really spent basically the last day with each of uh, these condemned people. And he got to know them pretty well. They got to know him. And they all he says they all reacted differently to him. And he was basically there until the end. Many of them had questions for him about, is this going to hurt? What's it going to be like the, the last few minutes? And he, f he was in a position where he often had to reassure them that, that it wouldn't hurt. Jerome, you had the opportunity to spend a good amount of time with Reverend Pickett, learning about his experience. What struck you most about his story? Uh, I think, Alex, what struck me the most was how he struggled with his own feelings about the death penalty. While he was a prison chaplain, uh, he uh, was there for 95 executions. Um, and the 33rd execution that I talk about in my story of Carlos de Luna, uh, started raising questions in his mind. He was a baby face. He had big, eye, big eyes, big brown eyes. And he was innocent. You know, I knew he was innocent. I knew about talking to him and listening to him. DeLuna was convicted for the fatal stabbing of a gas station attendant. But Pickett believes it was a case of mistaken identity. And while he promised DeLuna his death would be painless, it was far from that. Carlos, it was horrible. You know, I couldn't sleep for days and days. Even as he began to think that capital punishment is wrong, he continued uh, going and, and keeping the, the, his own feelings to himself. He talked about uh, what he called a ministry of presence, that however he felt, he should do God's work and be there with the, the inmate, with a condemned man or woman, um, right before the execution. Pickett came out against the death penalty after retiring in 1995. He is now a powerful voice in the movement to abolish it. When they're losing a loved one to the state of Texas. This video provided by the Texas Department of Criminal Justice shows the execution chamber where a condemned inmate is strapped down. At 6 p.m., if there's no last-minute injunction, a lethal injection is administered. 
There were massive protests right here in front of the death house back when Reverend Pickett attended his first execution. Now the death of number 505, Arturo Diaz, draws only a committed core of anti-death penalty activists, Texas Governor Rick Perry. He supports the death penalty and says Texas has never executed an innocent person. Reverend Pickett disagrees. So I was witnessing, witness to a murder by all the names of the state. His evolution toward being opposed to the death penalty came as a result of questioning of, of many of the questions that many other Americans have um, about whether it's effective, whether it really acts as a deterrent, and of course, whether uh, an innocent person uh, has been killed as a result of the death penalty. And again, Jerome Sokolovsky is VOA's religion reporter. Reverend Pickett retired in 1996 after 15 years in the Texas prison system where he witnessed 95 government executions and international records. Moving now to a story about rebuilding lives, an American dance company has an unusual mission to teach orphans and street children in Rwanda, Guinea, and Bosnia-Herzegovina the art and discipline of dance as a platform for education. Some of the children are survivors of genocide or have lived hard lives on the streets or in jail. VOA's Carolyn Weaver has the story. Most days, dancer Lamar Baylor is found in a New York theater performing in the Lion King musical. But for the last two years, he's also spent weeks here in Kigali, Rwanda, teaching ballet to boys living on the street part of an effort by the Rebecca Davis Dance Company. These children, their lives are nothing that we can begin to even fathom. They have been through things that no one should ever have to go through. They are genocide survivors. A lot of them have been incarcerated. They have been prostituted. They're street children. They have lost all of their family. Founder and director Rebecca Davis had the idea for the project when she was in Africa several years ago. When you start to play music, in Rwanda, these kids come out of nowhere <laughs> and they enter this center. And it's because of dance that they have a way of exchanging their physicality, their survival skills that they learn on the street and their strength into something that's actually artistic and aesthetic and something that starts them on a path towards mental development. That means offering schooling in information technology or English. Davis says she set up programs in Rwanda and Bosnia-Herzegovina because both countries are recovering from genocide. The company also has a program in Guinea, another poor country where relations among ethnic groups are tense. Lamar Baylor knows from his own experience how the discipline and self-expression of dance can be the springboard to a better life. Although he had a strong family, he grew up in one of the poorest, most violent American cities. Camden, New Jersey. And growing up there, you know, if I did not have dance, I'm really not sure what I would have become. I was a child who took a long time to find out what exactly was for me. And when I found dance, they, dance honestly saved my life. Since the program began in 2010, the Rebecca Davis Dance Company has offered dance, IT, and English language lessons to more than 2,000 children in Rwanda, Guinea, and Bosnia-Herzegovina, and has funded boarding school scholarships for about 30 Rwandan boys. Davis says there are plans to expand in all three countries. Carolyn Weaver, VOA News, New York. And with that, we've come to my least favorite part of the show, which is the end of the show. My least favorite part, too, but we will be back next time with a look at the effort to stop the flow of drugs from Afghanistan. And we go inside the U.S. Bureau of Engraving, where the world's leading currency is printed and with increasingly sophisticated security measures. All of our shows are, of course, online. Just find us at voanews.com, Facebook, and YouTube. Thanks for coming along on Assignment. Catch us next week.